Afternoon, everybody. Um, we'll reconvene the afternoon session of the Planning Commission meeting. And item on our agenda, County of Lake Planning Commission will host a public hearing where it will show an informational presentation and hold a public comment meeting on the draft environmental <laughs> impact report for the Gwinnock Valley Mixed Use Plan Development Project. Written and verbal comments will be accepted. The project applicant, Lotus Land Investments Holdings Incorporated, is proposing a general plan amendment for de to designate the Gwinnock Valley site as resort commercial in a rezone to Gwinnock Valley District, pursuant to the Middletown Area Plan Policy 6.3.1b. These amendments would allow for the development up to 400 hotel rooms, 450 resort residential units, 1,400 residential estates, and 500 workforce co-housing units within the zoning district. The draft EIR analyzes the effects of the proposed general plan amendment and rezoning of the Gwinnock Valley site to GVD, which is the Gwinnock Valley uh, district, on a pro programmatic level. In addition to the program level analysis, the draft EIR provides a project level analysis of the impacts of the first phase, phase one, of the proposed project. Phase one proposes a phase subdivision and related entitlements to allow at full build out up to 401 residential estates, 41 resort residential units, and 177 hotel units and accessory resort and commercial uses within the Gwinnock Valley site. In addition, phase one includes a subdivision and a rezone of the Middletown housing site to accommodate workforce housing, including 21 single family residences with optional accessory dwelling units, 29 duplex units in 15 structures, and a community club clubhouse and associated infrastructure. On-site infrastructure improvements under the proposed project include a proposed water supply well on an off-site well site and pipeline located adjacent to and within Butts Canyon Road, along with intersection and electrical improvements. The project location is 2200 Butts Canyon Road, Middletown. The project site is comprised of 49 assessor parcels totaling approximately 16,000 acres in Southeast Lake County. Mark. So good afternoon, planning commissioners, staff, consultants, and those who have taken the time to attend the discussion meeting on the draft environmental impact report for the proposed Gwinnock Valley Mixed Use Plan Development Project. As indicated on page four of the staff report, the purpose of the public comment meeting is to collect input from the public and agencies on the draft EIR. To assist in accomplishing this purpose, there will be two presentations. The first presentation will be done by the project applicants, which will discuss the project, and the second presentation will be done by the county's consultant, AES, which will explain the EIR process and present key findings from the draft EIR. Please keep in mind, no responses to comments will be provided at the public comment meeting as, as responses to comment made at the public comment meeting will be provided in writing in the final EIR as required by CEQA guidelines section 15088. Now I'll pass the presentation on to Kirsty. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the Planning Commission and members of the public and anybody else who's uh, paying attention online. My name is Kirsty Shelton and I am here today representing the property owner and the financial investor, Lotus Land Investment Holding, and also Maha, which is the resort developer. With me today include members of the development team in the audience, Kevin Case and Randy Sternberg, and with us virtually includes Chris Meredith, Jonathan Breen, and the Chu family. Firstly, I want to share how proud I am to be here today before you at a very significant project milestone that I have had the pleasure to work with an exceptional team of consultants, which include phenomenal and talented designers. And for the past two years, I have personally managed a team of over 35 specialists to present the project as designed today. As a land use professional, I'm exceptionally proud of how the project exemplifies the goals and direction of the Lake County General Plan, the Middletown Area Plan, and the Economic Development Plan. In fact, never in my career have I presented a project that is so in alignment with your goals. This is achieved by an innovative resort concept, highlighting the beautiful scenery, using a light touch on the land, and creating a very small development impact while preserving much of the landscape. As you can imagine, this can only be achieved by developing an ultra-luxury destination community within a unique residential component. 
Today I will start with giving you a lay of the land and providing you an overview of the ranch itself, and then I'll go into detail on the project specifics. For those of you who have had the pleasure to be on the ranch or have traveled within the vicinity, you're well aware this is a very beautiful property with a diverse landscape and hills ranging from 800 to 2,000 feet above sea level and also the renowned Gwinnock Valley. The proposed project area, we call it the ranch, is a 16,000 acre project site and it sits in Southern Lake County on the border of Napa County and just southwest of the Yolo County border. The ranch is accessed by Butts Canyon Road, approximately two and a half miles of its intersection with Highway 29 and the town of Middletown. The ranch has a rich history, home to many indigenous cultures over the past thousands of years, and then many homesteaders, and some of you may know the property from the Lily Langtree Estate and Winery. Please note, there is approximately five to 600 acres of land that was not purchased by the current owner, and therefore it is not part of the project, and therefore not part of the pre presentation. Over the last hundred years, the ranch has been continuously grazed, as you can see by the map of the historic grazing pastures here. Over the past 50 years, William Dieter engineered the water system that exists today. Most of you know the Dieter Reservoir as you drive along Butts Canyon Road, but that is just one of five small water reservoirs which, most, which store most of the watershed within the ranch. About 10 years ago, the ranch changed the water rights from irrigated pasture to allow for the irrigation of vineyards and agriculture. This means that 10,000 acre feet of current irrigation for the vineyards and some of our project will not rely on groundwater. The, approved, the approval 10 years ago allows for an irrigation footprint of 2,800 acres. But please note, you will see a large area of the light green area that's not currently developed in vineyards. We'll discuss that in a little bit. So this, this slide here shows the current developed and potentially developed vineyards on the property and on the ranch. It's uh, totaling about 1,700 acres, which we'll discuss. We're going to put in an agricultural preserve. The majority of the ranch is within the Middletown Area Plan, Special Study 3. The goals of this area plan was for this area of Lake County to focus on resort development with commercial uses as the primary use and grow the agritourism concept. The majority of the ranch is included in the Middletown Area Study area besides that red hatching in the bottom right corner. Now I'll go into the project description. I want to pause here because for the most part, my slides will focus on what we call phase one. This includes the project level EIR, EIR analysis with the, which the environmental consultant will go into more detail after my presentation. Our phase one includes our forecast development for the next 10 years. I, I personally love this slide because I think this is really the key of the project. As you can see, the entire area plan boundary as amended will be 16,000 acres, and our project as proposed as phase one is only 1,415. And however, that's less than 10% of the entire project area, and there's more than double of that in the designated open space and habitat corridor, which I'll go into more detail, and even more, larger than the project footprint is the Oak Woodlands Preservation. As I already discussed, the 1,700 acres of existing and proposed uh, vineyards will be in an agricultural preserve combination district, which results in the majority of the, pro the area boundary being in rural landscapes. This slide is the existing zoning. Most of the combining districts remain with an additional resource conservation overlay, ag preserve as discussed. This is To implement the goals of the Middletown Area Plan, it required a zoning designation that allows for mixed-use development. The Gwinnock Valley District proposed here allows for long-term planning and alignment with the Lake County General Plan goals. In the following slides, I will be presenting our specific plan, again, otherwise known as Phase 1, which is the forecasted development. So with the Gwinnock Valley District, these will be the combining districts as described here. One of the goals of this project is to maintain the designation of a boutique hotel, which requires 50 hotel rooms or less. This is achieved by having a Keystone Boutique Hotel as the flagship of five separate primary resort communities. 
These resort communities, which we'll go into detail in the next slides, typically have a boutique hotel surrounded by resort residential, which are small cottages for families to rent for longer stays, and then surrounded by low dis density residential, which I'll explain on the next slide. The low density residential is another primary goal of the project. It's easy to misconceive the development of this project. As you can see, the development impact ratio is minor. It results in 0.2 estates per acre, which is basically approximately one, one residential estate per five acres. As you can see by this piece of pizza, we call it, and this is a typical average lot. It's located in the middle of the site. It's hard to put in context because of the scale of the property. This is a six and a half acre parcel. Again, this is a typical residential development. The development envelope is going to be one acre to a maximum of no more than one and a half, which ultimately results in five acres of the residential lot in a preserve. And you should note, this is not as part of the open space corridor designated area that we've already disclosed. Now I'd like to start to discuss the resort communities. The Bone Ridge Resort community is designed by international acclaimed architect Ed Tuttles. It includes the design of a unique circular hotel and restaurant with the resort residential cottages and then surrounded by low density residential units. Within each of these resort clusters, every aspect of the project from the hotel units to the resort residential and even the residential estates will be designed by this particular architect. Again, the same thing with this cluster community. We call this one the equestrian center community. This is designed by Figueres Design Group out of Argentina. It includes two um, regulation size polo arenas, which are 12 acres. Again, it's kind of out of scale because here's the polo fields here. It looks so minor in comparison, but those are each 12 acres. It also includes a lodge with hotel units, again, with the resort residential, a community clubhouse with a berm for guests to be able to watch the polo matches, and then a stables for the horses, again, with the low residential estates surrounding the property, all to be designed under the same architect. <clears throat> This is the uh, Maha Farm community. It's designed by local architect Howard Backen and Associates. This is the most dense area of the project and it is the most easily accessible from the Butts Canyon Road. This will be where the village is. In fact, it is the most exciting because it includes 12 acres of market gardens to serve the true farm to table restaurant, a farmer's market, cafe, artisan barns to include animal husbandry, apothecary for everything besides cannabis, a post office, area for children to play, interaction with the Upper Bone Lake and a water recreation activities such as paddle boarding and canoe on the lake. And this is the most dense area, we call it the village. So you can see a picture down below. It's uh, the architecture is very farm, um, local materials, very natural. The Red Hell Estates community is designed by Deniston International Group and it's focused around the golf course. Um, there will be a, a circular, again a circular restaurant and the hotel with the resort residential cottages surrounding it and then ultimately the residential estates. The golf course community was designed by Tom Doak with Renaissance Design Group and to me the golf course is an exa example of how this whole project is designed. The, it wasn't the golf course that designed where it was going to be. It was the land that dictated where the golf course is. Um, it's a very natural course. It's actually a non-returning course, which means that it starts at the east and goes to the west. And it's about two and a half acres. And the intention for this is not only to be a golf course, but also somewhere where somebody would go for a walk. The resort uh, Trout Flat is a community designed by Cary Hill Architects. It is the most divert, it's the most um, remote cluster of all the clusters. It is also very harmoniously designed to the environment with rammed earth exteriors, uh, low flat roofs with green roofs. It's, it's designed to actually blend into the landscape and is the least dense of all of the communities. The spa community does not have a hotel aspect to it. That's why I didn't call it as part of the resort community. It's a spa and wellness center and then it's surrounded by 11 large real estate lots. 
The tent camp area is located on Puda Creek. It's for, to house about 20 um, tent camps for those guests who want the wilderness experience. And accessory uses. This slide shows all the accessory to resort uses that we have planned. Um, there is on the top is the central back of house operations where all of the resort functions will happen. The administrative functions, the housekeeping functions, staffing. And then the bottom is the fire station that's proposed to be built within the emergency resource center. Um, in addition, sporadically through the site are wastewater facilities to treat the water, solar fields, and what we call the pork chop site across the way, which is proposed workforce housing. As we discussed, this is the designated and protected riparian habitat corridor. The biologist directed that this is the most diverse area because of the Bucksnort Creek riparian area that ultimately connects to the um, east of the property to Puda Creek. As we discussed, the majority of the property will be, um, this takes out all the agriculture, all the resort development, everything proposed, and what is left is what we call rural landscape, which is essentially open space. Um, as part of the project, um, as some of you may know, uh, we originally wanted to, we were aware, even though it's not required, that workforce housing is needed in the community to support this use. So uh, we have secured a property in Middletown on Santa Clara Road. So as part of this project, we are asking for a uh, tentative map to be able to build affordable housing in this location, workforce housing. This is another summary of all the aspects that we've already discussed. That includes the riparian corridor. The darker green is the oak woodland preservation. Um, some of the aspects we haven't yet discussed is the riparian restoration, but most importantly what I'd like to highlight is that all of the wetlands have been avoided and are proposed for preservation. Agricultural development, and now I'm going on to the big boards in the room, so if anybody have already looked at it or if anybody has been to the, any of the previous public meetings, most of this is going to be a repeat. Um, the agricultural development, it's really exciting. We've already started to cultivate um, the native and endemic species on property and already starting to cultivate a, a very site-specific landscape. For the most part, it'll be native plants or um, farming vegetation as part of the landscape plan. Um, about 12 acres of market gardens around the Maha Farm to serve the community-supported agriculture, the farm-to-table restaurant, and to serve the project as a whole. Um, we discussed the equestrian pastures. In addition to the uh, uh, regulation polo field, there'll also be a pony camp for children and adults of all ages to participate in the equestrian activities. There's already an existing large network of trails for the horses. Um, We've already discussed the vineyards. All the vineyards either currently planted or in long-term leases will be in an agricultural preserve. And then most importantly, we are going to re-support um, the, the heritage and the history of all the grazing with sheep, cattle, goats, um, not only to uh, help with the fuel reduction, but also to serve the farm. <laughs> Um, one thing we haven't yet talked about is the uh, true commitment to sustainability from both the property owner and the applicant. Um, the goal of this project is to be zero net electrical energy, which means that we, are ha we have four or five locations for solar farms on top of integrated solar and efficient electricity throughout the property. Um, all of our electrical network is proposed to be underground. Um, it's a, a huge commitment and a, a large expense from the applicant. Um, all of the water from the property, potable water, will be recycled and reused for irrigation. Um, and we're already starting to compost everything to really cultivate an uh, organic mulch. If anybody would like gas, it has to be underground, which was all served from this uh, wildfire management plan. Um, for the most part, this is really exciting because I'm sure everybody in California is excited about what, what, how we're going to respond to our current situation. And we are very proud of all the efforts that we've gone above and beyond code. Um, for the most part, every single road will be a two-way road with fire breaks on either side. 
Um, there will be active landscape management fuel reduction. We've already drafted the CCNRs and um, it's uh, between 50 to 100 feet on either side of the road. will be either managed by grazing animals or with active fuel reduction tools. Um, we've had significant irrigated fire breaks, not only the vineyard, but also intentional irrigated fire breaks. Um, what I haven't touched base and one thing I did want to highlight was that surface water allocation, both the golf course and the polo greens, which are our biggest irrigation, will be reliant on the surface water rather than the groundwater. Um, they're also intentionally located to provide and act as irrigated fire breaks. Um, <coughs> the other thing that I haven't noted yet, but for the most part, a lot of these roads are existing ranch roads that exist today that we're only going to have to widen or even make new connections to be even more environmentally sustainable. Um, we will have a early detection camera on the highest peak of the property. And in, in addition, I'm happy to talk more about this, but we've gone above and beyond to cultivate a um, communication element and um, we're just really proud that we put a lot of energy to this. I tried to keep it short and sweet. I was told to be at 20 minutes, so I wanted to uh, give a real big picture overview. Um, we'll be having many more public meetings in the future. Um, I'm happy to ask the people. I've left business cards in the back. I'm very approachable. We also just now have a public website. Um, we invite everybody to come and learn how you can be involved. If you want to learn more about the project, if you have any questions, um, it's a very user-friendly website, and we hope that you all visit it. And with this, I believe I'm passing the mic to Ryan Sawyer with AS. Good afternoon, uh, Planning Commissioners and members of the public. I'm Ryan Sawyer with Analytical Environmental Services. We are the county's environmental consultant um, and assisted them in preparing the EIR for this project. Also with me today from AES is Kayla Knott. She's in the back of the room, and so if you have any questions about the materials in the back, Kayla can answer that for you. And Peter Bonadelli, he's trying to blend into the crowd there. Okay, so the following presentation is going to detail um, the environmental impact report. It'll provide a quick overview of the project. I'll try not to repeat too much of what Kirsty just went over. And provide a summary of the environmental analysis and discuss the next steps in the environmental review process and schedule. So to start off with a bit of background, um, the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA as we call it, requires that public agencies consider the environmental effects of discretionary actions prior to making a decision. So the environmental Inf um, impact report is an informational document. It informs the decision makers of environmental issues before they make a decision. It identifies potentially significant direct, indirect, and cumulative project-related impacts and describes mitigation measures that will lessen those impacts. The responsibility for preparation of the EIR is with the lead agency that approves the project and will also implement the project. So the lead agency prepares the EIR, conducts the pro public process, certifies the adequacy of the EIR, and then takes action on the project. In this case, the County of Lake is the lead agency. In brief, the project will require approvals from Lake County and other responsible agencies that will allow the development of a mixed-use resort and residential community on the Gwinnock Valley site, off-site workforce housing in Middletown, and an optional off-site water supply well and pipeline extending from SR-29 to the Wanock Valley site. The, project, the locations um, of the project that are analyzed in the EIR are listed on this slide, and generally um, we refer to them as the Gwinnock Valley site, which is the 16,000-acre ranch that Kirsty just described, the Middletown housing site, which is the potential location of, of the off-site workforce housing in Middletown, and that consists of 12.75 acres, and the optional off-site well site, which consists of approximately 37 acres just east of Middletown um, off of SR-29, and the pipeline alignment that would extend for approximately six miles along Butts Canyon Road. So 
This slide illustrates the location of the Gwinnock Valley site, the Middletown housing site, and the Wells site. Um, the crosshatch area here in black is the portion of the site that is not under the ownership of the applicant, so it's not a part of the project site that's analyzed in the EIR. The key requested county approvals are listed on this slide and include an amendment to the general plan land use designation of the site from agriculture, resource conservation, rural lands, and rural residential to resort commercial. A zoning ordinance amendment to introduce a new zoning district referred to as the Gwinnock Valley District, or GVD, that would allow for future uses of the site generally consistent with the goals of the Middletown Area Plan. Approvals um, also included entitlements for Phase 1 of the GVD, including phased tentative subdivision maps, and approval of entitlements for workforce housing in Middletown, including a rezoning of a portion of the site from single-family residential to two-family residential and a tentative subdivision map. This slide illustrates the proposed zoning for the Gwinnock Valley site. As you can see, the entire site will be designated Gwinnock Valley District, or GVD. And the project also proposes 1,700 acres of ag combining district, shown in black crosshatch, and 2,765 acres of open space combining district, shown, shown in the green there. The Gwinnock Valley District will permit development of up to 850 hotel and resort residential units, 1,400 residential estates, 500 workforce co-housing bedrooms, resort amenities, and accessory uses. The GBD would be developed over multiple phases, and at this time, detailed plans have only been developed for the first phase, which will be constructed over the next 10 years. Future phases will be built out based on market demands. Therefore, the draft EIR provides a programmatic analysis of impacts of the full build-out of the Gwinnock Valley District, while providing a project-level analysis for the impacts of the phase one development. Development of future phases will require additional sequel analysis that could tier off of the analysis in this EIR. So um, at this point in the presentation, I'm going to go over the details of the phase one project components, which is going to be largely repetitive of what Kirsty um, just um, presented to you all. So bear with me, and I'll try to go through it fairly quickly. So phase one of the Gwinnock Valley District would have a combined footprint of approximately 1,400 acres, consisting of five hotels with a total of 127 hotel units and 141 resort residential units, 401 residential estates, 100 workforce co-housing bedroom units, resort amenities, including an amphitheater, spa, equestrian areas, new golf course, camping area, and commercial and retail facilities. Agricultural production support facilities, including two wineries, essential accessory facilities, and these could, would include the back of house, a temporary workforce hotel, referred to as the Entourage Hotel, an emergency response and fire center, float plane dock on Dietert Reservoir, um, two helipads, and supporting infrastructure, including solar energy production areas and wastewater treatment plants and energy facilities. This slide illustrates the site plan for phase one. So the areas in maroon here, I think there's also a board of this somewhere, are the resort um, cluster developments. The blue parcels are the residential parcels. The parcels in yellow are the um, accessory facilities and the support facilities. And the green parcel there is the um, golf course. And, and the green hatching is the open space. So the undeveloped areas within the, within the site will include the approximately 2,765 acre open space combining district area, 1,700 acres of agricultural combining district, undeveloped areas within the residential lots as a result of the 1.5 acre development restriction in the Gwinnock Valley District, and 7,386 acres of general open space area is not proposed for development under phase one. However, it should be noted that some of this general open space could be subject to development under future phases. As required by the proposed design guidelines for the Gwinnock Valley District, which are included as Appendix DG of the EIR, site-wide lighting design will preserve nighttime dark skies in accordance with the dark sky initiative adopted by the county and the California building codes. And this will be accomplished by minimizing the, the use of lighting fixtures and where used, ensuring that all exterior lights are shielded and downcast. There are four options for electrical power distribution evaluated in the EIR. These are listed here and generally include uh, full electrical power distribution service by PG&E, private ownership of the electrical power distribution service with PG&E providing power to a single delivery point within the site, um, creation of a public utility district with electrical power distribution independent from PG&E, and this would include generation plus storage of power for the project's entire energy needs, 
And the final option is a hybrid of options two and three, where the applicant would own all the power distribution services, build the solar plus storage systems, and create the public utility district, but would sell the power back to pg and &E in the interim while the PUD is being established. As required by California law, the project will include the installation of solar panels to at a minimum meet the demand of the proposed residential units and would establish sufficient solar to meet the needs of commercial accessory uses, potentially under options two through four here. <clears throat> Site access will be provided through two entrances on Butts Canyon Road. The primary access will occur via a new entrance roadway and intersection, and there's two options for this evaluated in the EIR. The first option is located approximately two miles south of the Langtree Winery entrance, and the second option would be located at McCain Canyon, which is um, approximately 2.6 miles south of the Langtree Winery entrance. A secondary access point will be provided through improvements to an existing um, roadway. Both access intersections would include turning lanes and deceleration acceleration lanes as needed and would include stop and yield signs. Additionally, warning signs would be installed on both sides of the intersections as necessary for safety. Uh, given the remote location of the site, the applicant is proposing to develop an independent water and wastewater system to serve the proposed development. Sufficient on-site water and wastewater capacity for phase one and anticipated future phases um, has been demonstrated in the water supply assessment and the wastewater feasibility study that are provided in the EIR. The new water and wastewater systems would either be owned and operated by a newly established private utility or will be sold to and operated by an existing utility company or district. Potable water will be provided via deep water supply wells within the project site, and non-potable water for irrigation and fire supply will be provided through recycled water or surface water where allowable and optionally through the off-site water supply well, although it should be noted that the water supply assessment found that there are sufficient water supplies within the site to meet the needs of the project without the use of the off-site well. Wastewater treatment for the resort clusters and nearby residential development would be provided through centralized wastewater treatment plants that would produce high quality recycled water, while independent septic systems could be used for the more remote residential lots. Offsite improvements associated with the project include electrical transmission line upgrades. However, these would be limited to rewiring existing poles, and therefore the physical environmental consequences would be fairly minimal. Um, the offsite well, which we've discussed, access intersection improvements, and the offsite workforce housing in Middletown, and all of these, the effects of all of these improvements are evaluated in the EIR. The offsite workforce housing would consist of a total of 50 housing units, including 21 single family units, each with five bedrooms, and 29 duplex units, each with four bedrooms, a community center, and a community open space area. This site illustrates the site plan for the offsite workforce housing. Um, as shown here, the single family units are located on the edges of the site with the duplexes located in the center, and then the community center is uh, closer there to Dry Creek. So the draft environmental impact report um, is organized into the sections shown on the shown on this slide, and that includes the introduction, which is essentially an overview of the CEQA process and an introduction to the project. Section two, which is the project description, which goes into um, detail uh, on all of the project components that I described briefly today. Section three, environmental analysis, which is really the heart of the EIR, and um, this chapter is very uh, is the, the longest chapter, obviously, and it's broken into subsections for each of the issue areas that we go over in the EIR. And within each of those issue areas, we break it down further into existing setting, regulatory setting, the impacts of the project, and then the mitigation measures that are recommended. Section four is other CEQA considerations, which describes indirect and growth-inducing effects, as well as potential cumulative effects. Section five is an analysis of the alternatives, which compares and contrasts the potential impacts of those alternatives in comparison to the project and then report preparation references and acronyms. The resource areas addressed within section three environmental consequences are organized into the following subsections shown here. The topical areas within the draft EIR were determined based on the results of the scoping comments as well as the initial study. Extensive studies were conducted in support of the environmental impact analysis and were included as appendices to the draft EIR. These include multiple biological assessments and cultural resource surveys, traffic impact analyses, and water resource studies. 
So the next slides here are going to outline the, the key findings in the EIR. I'm not going to go into everything, but we wanted to highlight some of the topics that we've heard from folks recently um, or you may have questions about, but I'm, I won't go into everything, so just disclose this is, is it's not fully inclusive. Um, with respect to aesthetics, the draft EIR found that the majority of the proposed phase one development would not be visible from public vantage points. However, um, site access, access option two at McCain Canyon would result in significant alteration of the topography in that area that would be considered significant and unavoidable. Additionally, because the location of future development has not been identified, the draft EIR identified that development of future phases um, could have a potentially significant unavoidable effect to viewers along Butts Canyon Road, which is the county designated scenic corridor. With the incorporation of dark sky lighting strategies, the project um, would have a less than significant impact associated with lighting at the Guanoc Valley site, and similar mitigation measures were recommended to be implemented at the Middletown housing site. Regarding agriculture, currently there are approximately 1,100 acres of agriculturally zoned land within the Guanoc Valley site, and after the proposed zoning amendment, the project would preserve approximately 1,700 1700 acres um, in Ag Preserve Combining Zoning District, which is an overall increase in the Ag zoning within the site. The majority of the important farmland within the overall boundaries of the site is located within the Gwinnock Valley and is under separate ownership and therefore not a part of the project. Um, but within the project site itself, there are approximately 196 acres of um, important farmland and only 50 acres of this will be converted as a result of phase one with the potential for conversion of important farmland in future phases though. Mitigation requires that conservation easements are established on ag land of equivalent quality. However, because there will be a net loss of an important farmland, this is considered a significant unavoidable effect under CEQA. The project will result in emissions of criteria pollutants and greenhouse gases from construction and operation. Mitigation measures include construction best management practices, including dust control and the use of low emission tier four equipment and operational measures, including energy efficiency and transportation demand management, such as car <coughs> shuttles. Because Lake County Air Basin is an attainment for criteria air pollutants, these measures would reduce impacts associated with air quality to less than significant. However, generation of greenhouse gas emissions would exceed the thresholds associated with the statewide greenhouse gas reduction targets <laughs> and are therefore considered significant and unavoidable. The Gwinnock Valley site supports habitat for numerous special status wildlife and plant species, and the ER requires extensive mitigation measures to protect these species from harm during construction and operational activities. Measures include, but are not limited to, construction worker awareness training, pre-construction surveys, lighting measures, restricted construction times and fencing near sensitive habitats, habitat preservation, and restrictions on perimeter fencing to allow wildlife movement, and a detailed oak mitigation plan. There are approximately 4,500 acres of oak woodlands within the Guanoc Valley site, with 330 acres being impacted by the phase one development. The oak mitigation plan requires that residential lot development is restricted to a one or a 1.5 acre maximum buildable area, and oak woodland habitat is preserved at, an, at a ratio of 1.5 acres to every one acre impacted, and the impacts to individual oak trees are mitigated by replanting at either a two to one or five to one ratio, depending upon the size of the tree impacted. Cultural resources surveys of the site have identified over 60 known historic um, and archeological resources, some of which are also tribal cultural resources. Mitigation includes the avoidance of these known resources and also requires that the applicant retain a tribal cultural advisor, conduct construction worker awareness training, and prepare an unanticipated discovery plan. Additionally, professional archeologists and tribal monitors will conduct construction monitoring of initial ground disturbing activities. Groundwater pump tests and the water supply assessment technical appendix found that there are sufficient water supplies within the project site to support the proposed development without adversely impacting surface and groundwater supplies. Um, mitigation does require, though, that a safe yield pump test of the offsite well be conducted that demonstrates no drawdown of groundwater beyond 300 feet of the well. And additional mitigation measures are recommended associated with stormwater pollution and floodplain mapping. 
Due to the distance of the site from the nearest receptors, most of the noise impacts associated with the project were determined to be less than significant. However, the EIR did identify potentially significant impacts associated with the use of the float plane dock and helipads, as well as the increase in traffic-related noise along Butts Canyon. Mitigation measures include reduction of construction noise from equipment and trucks using techniques such as mufflers, and that non-emergency aircraft and helicopter flight times be limited to the hours of 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. However, after mitigation, the increase in traffic-related noise around, along Butts Canyon would still be considered significant and unavoidable. <clears throat> the draft ER traffic study identified potentially significant impacts associated with the level of service um, and traffic circulation at several intersections, including near-term impacts to locations on SR-29 and cumulative impacts to intersections outside of Lake County's jurisdiction. The traffic study also found that the generation of vehicle miles traveled per capita would be above the regional average and recommended thresholds developed by the state. Mitigation measures recommended in the IR include entering into an agreement with Caltrans for improvements to the SR-29 intersections, conducting a traffic study and implementing mitigation for the future phases of the project as they move forward, and implementing a transportation demand management program to reduce the vehicle miles traveled associated with the project um, such as shuttle service from the workforce housing in Middletown and carpool programs. With respect to wildfire effects, the proposed project itself incorporates a number of design features that are outlined within the wildfire management plan, including strategic fire breaks along roadways and drainages, livestock grazing practices, and exterior sprinkler systems. With the measures outlined in the wildfire plan, the draft EIR found that the project would have less than significant impacts related to exacerbation of wildfire hazards, However, mitigation was recommended to address post-wildfire measures that should be implemented in the event of a fire to prevent landslides and flooding. So the CEQA environmental review process for the proposed project was initiated with release of the notice of preparation <clears throat> on April 23rd in 2019, so about a year ago. The NOP described the project and identified the anticipated scope of analysis for the EIR. Comments responding to the NOP, both written and verbal comments, were documented and were considered during the preparation of the draft EIR. The draft EIR was released for public and agency review and comment with issuance of the notice of availability on February 21st, and currently we are in the middle of the 45-day comment period on the draft EIR, which will end on April 7th. Much like in the scoping phase, the comments on the draft EIR will be addressed in the final EIR. And some comments on the draft ER may require revisions to the text of the document. If such revisions are necessary, they'll be shown in the final EIR, which is anticipated to be released in late spring or early summer. When the final EIR is complete, the county decision makers will hold one or more public hearings to review the EIR and consider the requested approvals under the proposed project. Um, the draft ER and other project-related information can be um, viewed on the county's website at this link. It's kind of long, but we'll keep this up here so you all can write it down if you need to. And um, if you have any comments, you can, uh, and you have them here with you today, you can place them into the comment boxes in the back, um, or you can mail them to the county at this address. And I believe the county will also be taking verbal comments at the hearing tonight. And we do have a court recorder present, I believe, although I haven't seen her. She's here. Oh. And there she is, <laughs> Girl, wonderful, um, who will record your comments and will be sure to, to respond to those point by point within the draft year as well. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So Mark, we, it's my understanding that we're, we are just hearing the presentations and public comment today? Correct. So we're not actually taking any action, correct? Correct. Okay, so we'll open it up to public comment. Let's not everybody jump at once. <laughs> Be sure and state your name and sign the sheet there in front of you. And uh, are, are we going to limit it to three minutes, Danae? Um, or sure hands by how many people might. do you, how, how many of you would like to speak on this? I, yeah, I think we're okay. No, I, I think we'll be okay. We can all stay here till dinner time. <laughs> 
Yeah, go ahead. Uh, mine will be short. <clears throat> My name is David Velasquez. I'm here representing Taylor Observatory. And um, I was gratified to see some of the comments addressing the dark sky community, because that's something that we've been working towards for Lake County as uh, part of an ecotourism uh, emphasis, as well as just overall environmental quality uh, <clears throat> for Lake County. We want to try and maintain the rural aspect as much as we can. I was a little bit, um, well, one specific thing I'd like to see, I think I might have seen some reference to it in the large document, was the use of cool light, cool lighting, versus just the downward um, reflecting, which is all good. And the use of um, motion sensing and so on, that's all really good. But uh, to help us comply with the uh, international dark sky community requirements, if we can look at trying to um, require that uh, lighting be limited to, or lighting be specified as a 3,000 degree Kelvin, that tends to be the, uh, the standard for, uh, for good lighting and it's good for security and everything else, but it also helps with the dark sky. Um, the only other comment I wanted to make is when uh, the comments about glare and light were considered, in spite of everything you said, it was considered less than significant. My, my question is, what's con how do you make the decision whether something is significant or less than significant when writing that EIR? Good afternoon, my name is Diani Batchelder. My question is about my community, which is Middletown. So when you say workforce housing, is this big development going to hire locally? So uh, the people who are going to be living in this workforce housing who gets the community center. Obviously, they're going to be employees, correct, of, of the big development? I'm asking that question. Or is it open to any Middletown yeah. residents? Um, this is just a just a public comment period where we're just speaking. Okay, you know so, your concern. Here, you, we want to hear your concerns. Okay, so and, that's that's yeah. my concern, okay. and um, that's that's a big concern because it is in my community. And thank you, this is my first time. So so I would like to know. I mean, and I would like more information to make sure the residents who are living in this new development are also locally employed. That's my concern. And when you mention a community center, I would like to know, that's my concern too, is it open to the whole community? Because that's what you're calling it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Donna Mackwitz, and I'm a representative of Redbud Audubon S Society, and I have a prepared s little s statement. As representative for the Redbud Audubon yeah. Society, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to comment. We participated in the scoping meeting for this document, and although some of our concerns and requests have been reviewed, we still question the adequacy of the draft EIR in address to these concerns. We were submitting in-depth comments. Oh, we will be submitting in-depth comments before the April 7th deadline. Our concerns during the scoping review included the importance of maintaining wildlife corridors and the issue of night clear, which has just been um, mentioned. We have other concerns. The Maha planners seem to address the night skies issues, but we're concerned about who will monitor these requirements and also about the wording such as, as much as possible, instead of just stating, this is a requirement. The wildlife corridor issue appears to be addressed by a study from 2010, 
um, we would like to see cooperation with the recent Mayakaba to Berryessa Landscape Con Connectivity Network study. And also relating to this issue, leaving decisions about fencing up to the future owners association is not adequate. We expect viable habitat corridors to be identified and outlined now and then uh, built into the design of this project. The state development idea is problematic. It leads to fragmentation and blockage of wildlife corridors. The wording that addresses the issue of wildlife passage is vague, and the policies being suggested lend to unenforced and unenforceable standards. How will this project be monitored over the decades, and will the Maha developers fund the County of Lake to ensure continuing monitor of standards outlined for the project, or will it strictly be up to the homeowners associations? Um, this could be problematic. Uh, we look forward to continuing our relationship with the developers and planners of this major project. There is no doubt that it could be a positive project for Lake County and have beneficial impacts on our economy. However, it's a huge project and deserves scrutiny and public input. The developers are asking for a lot, rezoning and a general plan amendment. They appear to be sincere in their efforts to create environmentally friendly new community, and we expect more review of our environmental concerns will occur. And this was written by Roberta Lyons, the president of Redbud Audubon Society. And thank you very much. Thank you. I've just moved here, and Lake County has so many beautiful treasures. You probably are used to it all, but it's really wonderful. I'm Victoria Brandon, representing the Lake County Sierra Club. Uh, we're going to be submitting a letter, so I haven't had a chance to look at this whole document in detail yet, so this is just touching a couple of points that occur to us right away. Uh, there's a whole lot to like about this project. I think it's obviously going to be done first class. I like all the green impacts, the farm-to-table incorporation. Uh, the respect for the landscape, all that's wonderful. But there is a, what seems to me a glaring inconsistency with the area plan that I found quite troubling. Uh, the original Lake County 2008 general plan called for a maximum of 450 dwelling units on this property uh, the, in the Gwinnett Valley, which is almost entirely this, uh, this single property. And in the preparation of the Middletown Area Plan, which was a process that the whole community was involved in for years and was hammered out with great uh, difficulty at times, it was identified that it would be possible to increase this density by clustering development, avoiding places with high landslide risk, uh, mitigating for wildfire risk, and so forth, to 800 dwelling units. And now we've got 1,400. This is a really significant increase in density on the site. And uh, I think it's something that has to be addressed. Of course, legally speaking, this becomes mitigated completely by just rezoning the property. But whether this is appropriate for an area plan that was prepared with such a high degree of community uh, input uh, without also going back to the community and readdressing this, I really question whether that's an appropriate thing to do. Uh, I also want to express support for the concerns about wildlife connectivity that the Red Butter Audubon has already identified. We're going to be identifying some specifics in that too. Uh, a lot of it comes from, when this was first proposed, even in concept years ago, before this uh, property owner came forward with these, as I say, very admirable in many respects, specific plans, the assumption seemed to be certainly on the part of my organization, that it would be kind of village style, that there would be clusters, little villages of uh, residential development, and which gives the opportunity in such a large acreage to preserve a tremendous amount of open space and natural habitat and connectivity with other wild lands. Uh, instead, the development of the residential component into multi-acre estate lots loses a lot of that advantage, not only in the immediate loss of, of wildlife connectivity, 
but in the fact that it need, requires much more extensive development for bringing in infrastructure. Uh, utility is going to be undergrounded for a wildfire perspective. That's wonderful. But for a ground disturbance aspect, it's got problems attached to it, especially in connection with cultural resources, which I'm sure all those, uh, those that undergrounding is going to be done with tribal monitor on, on site and archaeologist handy for dealing with it and so forth. But even so, there's a lot of problems with that. And it seems to me a lot of this could be avoided by going to smaller lots in more closely more closely uh, clustered and allowing a larger area of wild space to be preserved. Uh, also, I've got a little quote that I just reminded myself of today on my way over here from the Middletown Area Plan again, saying that the general ob objective for residential uses is in accordance with smart growth principles, including walkable communities. And uh, the residential component here with all of these houses on their multi-acre lots is not going to create walkable communities. Um, it may be golf court rideable communities or horseback rideable, but not, not walkable village style, which is the, what we all had in mind in the first place. Um, going to have lots of additional um, co uh, comments specifically in our letter, but as I say, this we're also going to be commenting on some of the things we think is good here because I'll, there is a great deal that is. And I hope we'll be able, as the uh, comment uh, opportunity evolves and the, the EIR is refined in the preparation of the final to take the preserve the best while addressing some of the issues that are of concern. Thank you. Thank you. I would, <clears throat> excuse me, I would like to remind the public here as well as anybody who is listening live or maybe listening at a later point that we have until April 7th to address any of these issues that you may have with any of the points that have been brought up now or any other points you may may want to address. So to build on some of Victoria's um, thoughts on that. <clears throat> Um, my name is Fletcher Thornton. I'm a citizen, and they, uh, I live in Middletown. I, uh, we've watched this project for many years now, from our first meeting in Lower Lake at the old library, I think it was, just sitting around talking to, to this. <clears throat> I think everyone in Middletown area recognizes this as being a positive addition for South County. It's going to be a tremendous boost to Middletown and to the county as a whole. Along the way, we're going to have some negative things before we get to all the positive. That's just natural. You know, we're going to have trucks running up and down the road. We're going to have noise. We're going to have this. We're going to have that. But we have to look at it in, in the big picture. You know, in, in five years, and this will not only create income for the county and a significant income for the county, but it will help all the contractors, all the people who live in uh, Middletown. <clears throat> well, one time at the town hall, uh, a guy asked me, he says, well, they're not going to hire anybody from around here. They're going to bring in everybody. I said, they're going to hire a lot of people. I said, people don't buy a home on this kind of a project and pay the kind of money they're going to pay and mow their own lawns, fix their own roofs, uh, do their plumbing and all of that. So it's going to be a tremendous benefit for the workforce in Middletown. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure right now we have that workforce that could handle it if this thing was built. So I would hope that everyone that, that looks at this and tries to find negative well, look beyond the negative and think about how positive it's going to be down the road. Uh, sometimes that's tough to do because we, we, we want to be a little negative. We want to point out what you've done wrong. You didn't answer this. You didn't answer that. Well, I've been associated with these, this group 
even though I am not now, nor I have I ever been, an employee of Maha Lotus Land Guanac or Langtree. I was accused of being an employee of uh, uh, Dollar General when that thing came up. So, <laughs> because I, I said that uh, the zoning was right, we shouldn't let them build it. So, and I was attacked in the parking lot of the library by a lady. So. I'm careful about that. I don't work for them. I know them. I know some of them very well. And if I could assure the residents of Middletown anything, I would assure them that this is a first class operation, beginning to end. I, I watched them. They're out there digging giant oak trees out and, and transplanting them. Now, nobody in their right mind would do that. That wants to hurt the land, you know. So I've watched them, and I would, I would ask anybody that wants to get involved or want to comment that they take time to listen and to ask questions and then listen to the answer, more importantly, because you'll find that uh, this is a first-class outfit, and I'm looking forward uh, to them doing this project. I just hope... I'm 81 years old, and I hope I live long enough to see the end of it, or at least the middle of it. So thank you very much for your time, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thanks, yep. Fletcher. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kurt Style. I am a uh, property owner that I own property close to the potential off-site uh, well that they're discussing. Um, the, um, I, I think that the project is phenomenal. I think it, it's a great project. I've got no issues with the project. Um, in full disclosure, um, the Maha Group did um, approach me to purchase a parcel that I own right next to it. Um, for for the potential for water, um, and we were in talks, and and I would my main concern was I have I don't, I don't think any of you were around when we did the water ski project, but we have the water ski lake there, um, and my main concern was that we would have enough water to keep in the lake, um, and I told the Maha group that that was my main concern. I didn't care if I sold the property or not. It was really all about the water. Uh, when I saw the, the EIR and I saw that they were pr proposing to use the 37 acres on the corner of uh, 29 and Butts Canyon Road, I was a little bit concerned. Um, again, if, if the water needs can be mitigated, I don't have an issue. But when we proposed the water ski lake, we're, we were required to do pump tests, monitor all of the surrounding wells, and so forth. So I'm hoping that they would be held to the same standards. Um, my concern, again, is, I mean, the, and, and I don't know the exact numbers, but I did some rough math, and it, it looked like they were going to be getting approximately 6 billion gallons of water out of that aquifer. Um, and it concerns me that it's not proportional. It's not as though they have a 5,000 acre parcel that they're taking the water from. I mean, it's, it's a 37 acre parcel and taking that type of water concerns me. Again, if, it's, if it doesn't become an issue and the hydrologists show me, then I'm not gonna have a concern with it. But um, another concern, or not a concern, but a comment is they were saying that they had sufficient water on site, um, which is great. Um, Cause I, I had heard that they were drilling some wells and getting some pretty good water out of there. Uh, my question would be, why would they need an off-site well if they have sufficient water on-site? Um, the other question, is there a closer aquifer that they could tap into versus the one six miles away? Um, again, originally they were talking with me about water. I didn't have a problem with it, but I did have a problem with the amount of water. Um, I think those are my all, all my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. 
Mark? Are we done? Is that how this goes? <laughs> I would, uh, that would conclude the, the commenting meeting, correct, if no one else wishes to. I guess I'll ask one more time. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak right now? Okay. All right. We're going <clears> to <throat> close the public comment on this. And as I said, we are not making any recommendations or any uh, doing any votes on this. So um, is there, it'll be coming back to us. Is that correct, Mark? Is this, do you have a timeline on that or? So we're anticipating that final EIR, we'll, we'll start working on the final EIR after the close of the comment period. Okay. And we're anticipating that that will probably be ready sometime in June, early summer, or late spring. And then the public, the final EIR will be issued by the county. There'll be a 10 day waiting period. And then we'll start holding the hearings at the planning. Okay. And I will remind anybody, again, mostly people who are listening or listening at a later date, uh, hopefully before April 7th, but you have until April 7th to make public comments, written comments on this, whether they're concerns of yours or questions you would like to see addressed in the final EIR. Now is the time to, uh, to submit those. Show that slide again. Ask show it on the television. Oh, yeah. Can you show that on the television, that slide? so that people watching from home may be able to. <clears throat> and just to assure the audience, there will be plenty of questions from commissioners. This, that just isn't the point of today's gathering. Yeah. So, okay, that concludes, uh, concludes the hearing on this matter for today. <laughs>